Thank you all very much for coming out today. We really appreciate it. It should be an exciting talk um, by Professor Hausen. And we have copies of his paper, which are circulating. Um, so you should each be getting a copy of his paper. Uh, time is a little bit short, but there will be uh, time for questions at the end. And so with no further ado, here's Nico. <laughs> Thanks very much, Joe. Is that working, the uh, microphone? Yeah, OK. Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, uh, what we'll do is I'll start speaking, and hopefully um, uh, some of your number will come in uh, with fresh sushi, uh, which is a good thing, probably a better thing than coming to a talk in the middle part of the day. Uh, and then hopefully we'll leave some time at the end. I've been told if I can stop around uh, 1.30 or a little bit after 1.30, we can leave some time for uh, questions. As Joe said also, there's on that corner of the classroom uh, a printout of a draft of a paper that I'm going to publish. It's actually going to be published this month, uh, which uh, it relates to uh, one part of the topic that I'm going to describe uh, today. So let me jump into my remarks, and hopefully we can uh, leave lots of time for uh, questions. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, China Law and, is China Law and Policy or China Law Policy? Law and Policy. China Law and Policy Association, and the Arthur and Tony Remby Rock Center uh, for Corporate Governance for uh, giving me a, a platform today to come to the Stanford Law School and speak to you. Um, today I'm going to speak facially about two things uh, 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 possibly of interest. One is uh, insider trading and the regulation of insider trading in the People's Republic of China. And as I say, a lot of those thoughts are embodied in this paper that I'm about to publish, a copy of which is over there. Second, I'm going to talk uh, about tax regulation and enforcement of the tax laws in China, again, in the People's Republic of China. And here I'm going to draw on the work of one of my colleagues and friends, uh, Cui Wei, who's a professor at um, uh, China University of Politics and Law, uh, otherwise known as Fada to most of you. Now, it seems that I will be talking about the regulation and enforcement of insider trading and uh, taxation law. In fact, I think I'm going to be talking about a certain kind of progress or not towards what some would call rule of law in the People's Republic uh, of China. Um, it's easy now when we look at China to identify rule of law deficits in perhaps the criminal procedure sphere. We are used to seeing reports of people being deprived of their rights, being deprived of uh, lawyers, uh, not having the ability to cross-examine adverse witnesses, et cetera, uh, et cetera. But my position is that if you think about the rule of law having anything to do with limiting the power of the state to exercise its, uh, its monopoly on power and limiting that exercise of that power to something which we can identify as legal constraints or constraints that live in law, and if we're concerned about providing redress to citizens, to people who are enforced against, whenever the state, whether directly or through administrative agencies, goes beyond those constraints, then I think we're actually talking about uh, a rule of law. Now, if you need a sort of a piquant or an interesting context to uh, digest my remarks today, uh, many of you will have read about the case of uh, uh, Ai Weiwei, who's a, uh, one of the many sons of the wonderful poet Ai Qing, who recently was uh, put under house arrest and then is now is currently entangled in a, a litigation and a criminal defense uh, uh, procedures with respect to his non-payment of tax uh, or the non-payment of tax by a company that he apparently controls. Uh, in China. Now, uh, a lot of the reports have identified Ai Weiwei's case as sort of uh, a payback for some of his uh, uh, quasi-dissident activity or his uh, pol political uh, resistance. But I will remind you that the case that has ensnared uh, uh, Weiwei uh, relates to tax payments, tax law, and the enforcement of tax norms in China. And if Weiwei uh, was here today, I think he would find a great deal uh, to ponder in my presentation with respect to how legal, or as I'm going to assert, how illegal some of the norms uh, that are proffered in the Chinese context as legal norms uh, uh, truly are. And finally, my presentation today is uh, uh, about an orientation that I perceive, and perhaps many of you perceive, in how government departments in China operate, the assumptions upon which they uh, operate. 
And then also, given the uh, wide room we have notionally for legal challenges uh, to some of this uh, uh, overweening action or breaching action by government departments, I want to note and consider the remarkable tolerance we see for perhaps illegal activity, or what I will assert is illegal activity, by administrative uh, departments uh, in China. And I guess finally, if you take both of those uh, aspects, the orientation of government departments, how they exercise their power, and the relative tolerance among the governed for plainly illegal enforcement of certain kinds of norms, maybe that will tell us something about uh, the state of uh, the Chinese legal system now more than 30 years after reform and opening, out, uh, uh, opening to the outside uh, world. OK, first of all, um, this idea of administration according to law, or as you see it in the Chinese documents continually, is yi fa xing zheng. Uh, and this association between yi fa xing zheng and rule of law uh, government, or fa zhi zheng fu is the, the current term in China, uh, has quite a long history, at least in, uh, in the last uh, uh, decade. It relates to a problem that has been identified by academics, certainly, by journalists, uh, even domestic journalists in China, certainly foreign journalists, and even the regulatory departments themselves uh, in China. Um, in a word, what is the problem? The problem is that several, many, government agencies in China act illegally. Now, it can be said that they act illegally because they act with no legal basis, no basis in law. It can be said that they act illegally because they act in excess of the scope of legally delegated power or power delegated in law. Or they act on a basis which is in itself not legal on the basis of a norm which is not an item of law or administrative regulation, but is instead some other kind of norm that comes from some other uh, kind of place. Now, these issues and the issues I'm going to talk about today are a little bit distinct from another focus of a lot of the discourse about administrative problems in China. And those problems go to the uh, nature of rulemaking and lawmaking, how transparent, how checked. Uh, they are. I'm not going to talk too much today about that separate problem of norm production, although it is a problem that should certainly uh, uh, knock around in the back of our mind. As I said, this is a problem which has attracted a lot of attention in official pronouncements and even legislation over the last 15 years. In 1996, uh, the PRC promulgated the Law on Administrative Punishments. Article 55 forbids the imposition of administrative punishments without a statutory or a legal basis. Article 3.2 of that same law invalidates administrative punishments that are rendered without a statutory basis. In 2004, the State Council uh, promulgated or issued something called an outline for implementing the full promotion of administration according to law. Paragraph 1 of that articulation of policy exhorts administration according to law and slams what they call illegal or non-legal administrative uh, uh, action. Excuse me. Uh, paragraph 5.1 urges administrative agencies to act in accordance with what? In accordance with law and, uh, and administrative regulations or departmental rules and forbids administrative action that is not stipulated in law or things that are recognized as legal norms, i.e. administrative regulations. In 2008, the Chinese government promulgated regulations on open government information or known as the regulations on open government. Again, in that enactment, we see a presumption that all government information, including rules and norms uh, that are issued or promulgated, be disclosed publicly and transparently and establish mechanisms to compel that disclosure to the public and also provide remedies to people who are, have these norms visited upon them uh, in, in a non-transparent way. In November of 2009, the P PRC Supreme People's Court issued a regulation which forbids, specifically, judgments rendered, case opinions, that refer to any norm that is not recognized as a legal norm. Okay, So you can't say, I have decided the case between the plaintiff and the defendant before me based upon a secret norm, or a norm that is not public, or a norm that has not been produced via what we think of as the uh, legal system. Finally, in 2010, two years ago, the State Council again uh, uh, promulgated an opinion regarding strengthening the rule of law government, what I called a minute ago the fa zhi zheng fu. Uh, paragraph one of that same, uh, that same uh, uh, opinion 
talks about, again, administration according to law, yi fa xing zheng, being a key aspect of rule of law, not rule by law, but rule of law, and the construction of a rule of law government, or fa zhu zheng fu. The other thing to note in all of these pronouncements is that alongside the rhetoric that says administration should be done according to law are, is the provision of ample remedies for the people who are governed to resist any kind of enforcement or implementation of law, sorry, of any norm that is extra legal. Okay, so there's a little bit of bite here. It's not just rhetoric that we're discussing. It's uh, the idea that the people who are governed should have remedies to resist the imposition of norms upon them that is, in some sense, um, illegal. Okay, my first example, which is not in my own paper, but in Tsui Wei's good paper, is how this situation has rolled out recently in the tax enforcement regime. And because of time limitations, because of this is not my first love, where is tax anyone's first love? No, I, I take that back. I'm sure there are tax uh, specialists here, or want to be tax specialists here. Um, I'll, I'll give sort of short shrift to this, but it does give us a good sense of uh, a, a good, uh, a, a little taste of what the problem is that I'm going to examine perhaps in more detail when I talk about the regulation and enforcement against insider trading in China today. In December, on December 15, 2009, the uh, State Taxation Administration, which is like the IRS in China, promulgated something called administrative measures for the um, making of uh, tax normative documents. Now, normative documents is, as we will see, a term of art in the Chinese uh, uh, circumstance. But these are administrative measures which seek to govern this rapid and voluminous uh, uh, issuance of uh, uh, norms that don't qualify as law or as administrative uh, uh, regulations. Now, these measures do a great deal um, uh, in terms of binding the State Taxation Administration with respect to what kinds of norms it issues and then how it enforces those norms. Here are the, uh, here are the highlights from those measures. First, um, uh, the measures state that any normative document that seeks to be uh, binding on the public at large be issued publicly. Okay, now, as I see, list each of these things, you have to think of what the converse is. That means the problem is that, indeed, many norms uh, issued by the tax authority are not issued publicly. And you need to question as to how valid those would be. Second, normative documents issued with respect to tax law cannot be effective retroactively. Again, think of the negative implication, which is that the State Taxation Administration has been in the business of issuing uh, tax notices, as we'll see, that in a sense jump back and uh, seek to be enforceable uh, looking backwards or long before they were uh, promulgated. Third, the measures declare that any norm issued by the State Taxation uh, Administration must be um, uh, approved by the legal department and must be the product of a transparent process. And finally, as I mentioned a minute ago, in terms of the uh, large scope of this problem, uh, there are in the measures a provision and, again, exhortations for private actors taking their remedies when they feel uh, a non-transparent or an illegal norm in the taxation sphere has been uh, visited upon them. Now, what is the problem that that 2009 notice was responding to? Well, very simply. The State Taxation Administration and the Ministry of Finance in China has for years acted illegally, OK, and not in conformity with the law. For years, almost all of the substantive tax rules in China have been carried in informal circulars, certainly not publicly issued, often circulars that are really just correspondences between uh, different tax administrations. For instance, the Central Tax Administration sending a letter down to a, a subordinate uh, uh, tax office, okay? Not transparent, not public to the people who are being enforced against. All of these norms that are uh, apparently uh, issued, or at least um, in the lifeblood of uh, the tax enforcement world, none of them qualify as departmental regulations, which is the, sort of the lowest order of administrative regulation in the Chinese circumstance. Now, this is notwithstanding the fact that Chinese law or statute is replete with explicit delegations of power to who? To the State Taxation Administration. So you would expect, as you look in the uh, Enterprise Income Tax uh, Implementing Regulations, which are key administrative regulations in the taxation sphere, you see 29 instances where the law, or in this case, the implementing regulations, delegates the power to the uh, to administrative agencies, administrative bodies, including the STA, primarily, 
to fill out, to elaborate, uh, to uh, talk about procedures that are uh, important with respect to enforcement of the uh, tax laws. Now, in the period between 2002 and 2010, the Ministry of Finance and the State, Sa State Taxation Administration issued only 22 qualifying administrative regulations, only 22. In the same period, in the same period, they issued um, uh, uh, perhaps, um, a, 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 what, what I have from my data is 1,300, 1,300 circulars, just internal communications. I shouldn't say issued. There were these internal communications which sought to be binding on uh, uh, taxpayers. There's really no explanation as to why the STA, the State Taxation Administration, uh, proceeded in this way, uh, why they didn't take the statutory delegation of power and issue regulations uh, uh, publicly. But the fact is that's the way the Ministry of Finance and the State Taxation Administration has operated for more than a decade as things become more complex, as there's more statutory material to uh, try and understand. These internal circulars, these notices, govern the most substantive aspects of tax law in China. And frequently, you won't be surprised to know, uh, violate uh, taxpayers' rights uh, grant, granted to the taxpayers uh, of China. Now, there are many examples, and I'm just trying to think of an example in my notes that is, uh, would be most uh, uh, interesting or important for you. And maybe it's this. Um, uh, in 2009, the STA promulgated two notices, two internal correspondences, which basically deprive not-for-profit entities of certain tax treatment, or exact, actually the exemption of, uh, 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 which were provided in the law for so-called non-taxable uh, income. These internal circulars, these notices, deprived uh, taxpayers in China, and in particular kind of politically hot not-for-profit uh, uh, institutions of something, a key aspect of their livelihood, of their operations, that had been granted in the law, in statute. Okay, So you need to ponder that. What's happening, there's an alteration of legal rights, a deprivation of legal rights that comes through these sort of uh, utterances that are uh, very, uh, very much uh, under the radar uh, uh, by, by the tax authority. Now, in this particular case, many foundations in China and actually foreign foundations wrote the state council and said, hey, this is a disaster. You can't deprive us of all those things that are granted to us in the law via this kind of secret norm that is promulgated, not promulgated, but uh, exists out the back door and is apparently uh, known to all. What you will understand when you understand Chinese law is that that uh, uh, writing the state council is actually not very useful in this circumstance because those kinds of norms are not reviewable, it turns out, by the state council or certainly by any judicial institution. And in fact, um, if the state council did wake up and say, geez, we've really got to investigate this problem and determine if these utterances are legal or not, uh, they would only be able to do it, they would only do it on their own, sua sponte. They wouldn't do it in reaction to any kind of civil action or any kind of civil remedy. Okay, my second example, and obviously the one that's much closer to my heart, is I want to say more sophisticated. I don't think it's more sophisticated, but it's slightly more complex and introduces, um, uh, introduces us into the weeds of, uh, in particular, US and European insider uh, trading law. But I want to summarize what the problem is. And again, this is in, um, you get a full helping of this if your eyes glaze over while I'm speaking now in the, uh, in the paper that we've uh, uh, provided. The problem with respect to insider trading enforcement in China now is this. First, the administ well, the ad not first, this is the totality. The administrative norm that is used for enforcement against insider trading in China presently is, in my view, and I think in any fair and considered view, illegal. And that makes administrative enforcement, enforcement by the CSRC, which is a department we'll hear a lot about, the China Securities Regulatory Commission, itself illegal. Uh, the worry, or the additional worry we have, is that the state prosecutor, the people's procurate in China, is using those same norms that I'm suggesting are illegal in an administrative context in the criminal enforcement context. So that says that not only is the enforcement illegal when it's just fines or um, disgorgement of illegal profits, it's also illegal in the criminal context. We have the people's procurate perhaps enforcing against defendants, sending them off to, for prison terms on insider trading based upon a norm that I'm going to assert very strongly, I hope, that is um, uh, illegal. 
Now, as you'll see in the paper, and as I'll try to describe in the minutes I have today, I believe that these norms are illegal for the following reasons. First, the norms that are called for in the statute that governs securities trading and issuance in China uh, uh, is not the norm that has been issued or is used or employed. The statutory language is very clear. The CSRC, and this is the last time I'll say the full name of it so you can listen, China Securities Regulatory Commission, the CSRC has delegated power to do something which in Chinese is gui ding, to stipulate uh, one aspect of uh, insider trading liability. They do not, in response, issue something which I believe is uh, commensurate with that verb form to gui ding. They do something else, and we'll talk about it in a second. Second, and this is perhaps more important, I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's more important, it's less technical. The norm that they have used and issued is ultra vires on two counts. First of all, the norm addresses far more than what is asked for under the delegated power in the statute. And as I'll describe hopefully in a minute, what the CSRC is permitted to do under the statute is to fill out a list of additional persons with knowledge of inside information, i.e. defendants in an insider trading case. They take that power and they issue a norm which covers much more, much more than just adding the names or the status of different people who could be caught in an insider trading web. The second aspect of the ultra virus attack is, uh, is related to what I've just said. It's this. There is a clear system for insider trading liability set forth in the China securities law. And I'll talk about that in a second. What this, these, excuse me, what I call illegal and ultra virus norms do is rejigger the system or the scope of liability for insider trading radically, almost completely undo what you are allowed to do under the statute and create a whole new world of liability. So that's the second uh, part where I say um, uh, that, uh, that, 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 um, that, that, that it's ultra virus. Um, uh, and as I'll say, hopefully, in my remarks, I think we have, to, uh, we have to ask very serious questions as to why the CSRC, which I will just declare up front, I think is the most terrific administrative agency in, in China. So this is not a backwater administrative agency where we would expect them to, uh, to be meeting with failure or putting out this kind of uh, what I call illegal norm. Uh, they really are uh, the very best. We have to think about why they're doing this. Uh, there's some cynical views and there's some not so cynical views. But also we have to consider why there is, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, such tolerance on the part of people who are enforced against, as I would say, um, uh, illegally. OK, very quickly, a little tutorial on insider trading law. And this has nothing to do with China. This impacts upon how we decide whether or not there is uh, uh, insider trading anywhere in the world. Some of you may know that insider trading law tends to focus on two aspects of activity. One focus, is a, one focus is a focus on the who. Who has committed the insider trading? Who has traded on non-public material information for gain? That focus says that there are certain kinds of people, really defined by their status or duties that they have breached, who will be liable for insider trading if everything else fits. There's an alternative focus, which is actually much uh, wider, which says, ah, there is valuable non-public information out there. Whoever uses it, we don't care whether you're king, queen, pauper, insider, outsider, whoever uses that information should be guilty of, or potentially should be guilty of insider trading. Now, the two uh, ways we talk about those, as I will talk about in these remarks, is the first idea, the who, the focus on the who, we think of as a breach of duty idea. Somehow there are people who have breached the duty and, trade and, and c committed uh, uh, securities fraud by uh, trading fraud by uh, trading on information. The other theory, which is broader, we call the equal access theory. And that really says that everyone in the market should have access, equal access, to this highly valuable information. The minute anyone touches up against that information and uses it for their private benefit, um, they should be guilty of insider trading. Now, just to give you a very quick example as to how this might work, um, posit uh, a drug company which is making a cancer-curing drug. 
uh, and there's a CEO of said drug company. And the CEO of said drug company is actually a person who's uh, very involved in high society in New York, say, always having uh, parties uh, in, in the Hamptons. One of his friends is a high society lady who comes out to the Hamptons uh, uh, to visit, uh, to, to, to attend one of the parties. Now, um, this drug company gets very bad news from the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, whereby uh, it turns out that the FDA is not going to approve the magic drug, the magic cure drug. And that news is communicated by a fax, which comes into uh, the CEO's uh, office uh, at his Hamptons house. The high society guest is going to the bathroom and actually sees the fax uh, lying on the desk. Okay, She goes to the bathroom, sees the fax, goes, ah. Looks like this company is not going to be such a good investment. I better do what? Exactly what the CEO is going to do on Monday. I didn't say this was a Saturday. On Monday, dump the shares in the, um, uh, the drug company. Now, the classical or fiduciary duty approach to insider trading would say that if the CEO, as an insider, who owes technically a fiduciary duty to all the people that he might trade with, if he dumps his shares on Monday morning, he will be guilty of insider trading. Okay? What's critical to understand is that he has a fiduciary duty as an insider at the company, as the CEO and probably the chairman of the board. The high society guest who merely sees the, uh, the bad information for the wonder drug has no duty to anyone. Right? It's just a guest who has uh, happened upon this very, very important and very valuable non-public uh, information. So under our notion of classical insider trading liability, the high society guest, even if she dumped her shares um, uh, uh, the next, uh, on Monday morning, would not be guilty of insider trading. Okay, now there's lots of cases to fill out how all this works. The one exception to the high society ladies uh, case is what we have developed recently since 1997 in the United States called the misappropriation <coughs> theory. There's an alternative theory now, and it's quite new in the United States and worldwide, that says even if the high society lady hasn't violated a duty to the people that she might trade with, she might sell her shares to, if she's violated a duty, say, to the source of the information, uh, uh, if she has stolen the information uh, from the CEO's desk or uh, done something else or broken a, 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 a bound of, uh, of confidence, then you can say there could be uh, insider trading liability. But in my example, you notice the high society lady didn't do anything wrong. She did not misappropriate the information. She just happened upon it while she was going to the bathroom. Now, the equal access theory, which is very broad, says, I don't care about high society lady and what duties she has to anyone. She trades on this hot kryptonite information called inside information. She's guilty of insider trading. You see the difference? In equal access theory, we're just looking at the information. Anyone who uses it, bam, is stuck with insider uh, trading uh, liability. So in your heads, I want you to think of the classical uh, slash fiduciary duty theory of insider trading. I want you to know about this new idea of misappropriation. And then I want you to think about this huge hit um, called uh, the equal access theory. Now, China, when it was conceiving of its own insider trading uh, regulation, had a choice, right? Was it going to do what the United States has done and create classical slash fiduciary duty liability plus maybe misappropriation? Or was it going to go whole hog and create uh, the, uh, a liability based upon the equal access theory, i.e., whoever touched up against this information? Well, when you look at the statute, it's fairly clear that what China elected in the, um, in the late 90s with its, I'm, I'm sorry, in 2006 with the revision of the China securities law is a mix of uh, um, uh, classical slash fiduciary duty plus misappropriation, and in a sense rejected the idea of the uh, behind the equal access theory. You see that in the statute in Article 73 and Article uh, 76, which prohibits trading by those with knowledge of inside information. That's sort of the classical idea, the classical theory, and those who misappropriate inside information. That's the misappropriation. Uh, 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 prong. The other thing you see in Article 76 is also something familiar from our insider trading law, which is that you can have liability if you tip others. If you are one of the people who is in breach of your classical duty or has misappropriated, and you take that information and say, dear wife, dear husband, you should sell those shares or buy those shares. That's called tipping. Okay. So those are the basic um, 
uh, pathways for liability for insider trading in the Chinese, if you look at the Chinese uh, statute. Now, Article 74 then goes on to narrow down the classical, uh, uh, the classical notion as to who precisely are people with knowledge of inside information. If you look at Article 74, it gives you an explicit list of kind of orthodox uh, company, market, uh, service professional uh, uh, insiders who could be caught under that web. However, Article 74.7, and this is where I get very interested, delegates power to the CSRC to do what? To add to that list of persons with knowledge of inside information. So when you look at the statute first, you think, oh, it's just a limited group of people who could be caught as persons with knowledge of inside information. Ah, but there's a delegation of power to the administrative agency to widen that out a bit, OK? And obviously, it's in response to that delegation that I have a problem as an administrative law analyst. Because what happens in 2007, after the effectiveness of the new securities law, is the CSRC goes crazy. Of course, they don't go crazy. What they do is conceive a new, a new norm. It's not a regulation. It's not a law, of course. It's not a departmental regulation. It's merely a guidance document. It's merely something internal. What does it do? It takes that little narrow delegation to add to the list of classical insiders and blows a hole through the whole system, creates a whole new basis of insider trading liability, which, as I will demonstrate, hopefully, looks exactly like the equal access theory. It says that anyone who uses inside information is guilty of insider trading. So just to be very clear, I hope you understand what the point, this is the whole point of the paper and the point of the presentation. Based upon a very narrow delegation just to add to the list of who are insiders, basically, for the prong of insider trading liability that talks about people with knowledge of inside information, the CSRC takes that and blows a hole through it and recreates insider trading liability um, uh, anew. Anew and in a way vastly expanded from what the statute allows or calls for. Now, would this matter if, in fact, China was not enforcing uh, a pursuant to these, this wider uh, uh, norm that it was promulgated, not promulgated, issued or conceived secretly? Probably not, but that's not the facts. The facts are, and my research shows, and you can all uh, look at the CSRC uh, decisions, the CSRC is right now enforcing insider trading pursuant to these, uh, the, the guidance document, these illegal norms. And they're doing it in cases where they couldn't capture insider trading pursuant to the statute. So I hope everyone is very clear and you see the abuse. Authorized under statute and administrative regulation to attack a certain kind of activity, which they call insider trading, the CSRC as an administrative body is actually swallowing a whole bunch of other activity pursuant to this other norm this guidance document, OK? And that obviously should cause us all to pause. Now, because I only have a few minutes left, I won't go into the very searching and probably incredibly boring analysis as to why there's a problem with these, with the guidance document or the, the, uh, the guidance. And again, some of that's um, uh, addressed ad nauseum uh, uh, in the paper. I'll just give you the summary, which uh, is actually a repeat, because I think I gave it in, in the introduction. First, 74.7 of the securities law authorizes the CSRC to guiding, to regulate uh, uh, other people, uh, to list other people with knowledge of inside information. In fact, what issues, or doesn't issue, what is conceived is not something which is responsive. If you look at either the text of the securities law or other laws in China which talk about what is valid administra administrative regulation, do, what issues does not conform to that verb to, uh, to Gui Ding. Second, as I've also uh, described, and I would love to, well, maybe I've already done it by telling you what classical insider trading law is. The norms, the guidance document that is now used for enforcement is completely and totally ultra virus to what the statute offers in terms of insider trading liability. First of all, the guidance, which is responsive to Gui Ding, to Gui Ding what? a couple of extra people who might be persons with inside information, knowledge of inside information, does much more. It responds in a way that only a glutton could respond by talking about everything, talk, recasting insider trading liability. And second, and this of course is the more intuitively, I think, understandable uh, 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 approach, 
is that what is offered via the guidance document for insider trading liability is a very robust idea of, um, of equal access liability rather than the classical slash fiduciary duty plus misappropriation, which apparently is called for um, in, the, uh, uh, in the statute. So um, it's all well and good for a law professor like me and a former practitioner to say, oh, I've perceived of a problem uh, uh, in this administrative norm, which is visited on the heads of certainly uh, people, uh, civil defendants and probably also uh, criminal defendants. The real test of any legal system, of course, is the extent to which the people have those illegal norms visited upon them can turn around and say, uh-uh, government, whether it's an administrative agency or a criminal prosecutor, what you're doing to me is illegal and should not be enforced. Now, in the paper, I offer kind of a, uh, 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 sort of a, a structured um, analysis as to, um, as to how precisely you could challenge these norms or the visitation of these norms if you were a, uh, if you were a defendant. And um, again, I'm not going to go into great detail because we only have just seconds uh, left in, in my part of the presentation. But you would think that there would be opportunities for um, uh, challenges to administrative enforcement, challenges both that we talk about as abstract, i.e., that norm on its own, even before you've enforced it, is illegal, and then concrete. Oh, you're seeking to enforce that? You're finding me for that? I want to resist. We talk about that as concrete or review of concrete administrative action. And the first one is review, of, uh, re review in the abstract. You'd also think that we would have those two kinds of attacks uh, in the criminal uh, uh, enforcement sphere. Well, uh, the truth is that on the abstract side, it's very difficult to conceive of any significant alley whereby anyone who is enforced against using these illegal norms could, um, uh, could bring a, what we think of as, a, a, as an abstract challenge. Uh, that's either in the administrative, um, uh, in the, on the administrative side or the criminal side. There is the potential for something like administrative reconsideration for administrative enforcement. But again, who does the administrative reconsideration? The same agency which has visited this illegal norm on you. So I put it to you guys. How successful do you think that would be if you go to your oppressor and you say, hey, by the way, you're oppressing me. And they say, well, <laughs> we are, but you know, we've got the power to continue oppressing you. <laughs> oppressing is not, not a good word, of course, uh, in this circumstance. Um, with respect to criminal enforcement, I think there's, uh, there's better news. There's happier news. The enforcement of these norms uh, via Article 180 of the PRC criminal law, if they're actually using this alternative basis for insider trading liability could be challenged, certainly on appeal. right? Any appellate court in China could say, in response to a defendant's assertion that the underlying theory is illegal or ultra virus, they could certainly say, yep, yeah, we'll overturn that conviction. Okay? That's a possibility. It does happen occasionally uh, in China. There is also a way to think about um, a challenge uh, with respect to these norms as um, uh, as, uh, as action, government action, which is in breach of uh, a number of statutes, including the Constitution. Uh, again, though, uh, you might need uh, a, a judicial institution to step in to say, uh, to, 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 to draw, draw back uh, uh, enforcement. Now, as I do have less than one minute left, I'm not going to uh, discuss too much about whether this is a good or a bad thing. Uh, you, some of you may scratch your head and say, well, he's really going to offer us a theory as to why illegal enforcement of illegal norms is a, is a good thing? Well, you might, right? And maybe we'll bring it up in the Q&A. You might have such a problem with insider trading and uh, uneven uh, securities markets. You think, hell, why not? Let's make the enforcement really robust. Even if it is illegal, it's a really good thing to stamp out in any way. No one's going to mind because all these people are evildoers. There's another critique, which again we may discuss in the Q&A, where we might say it's actually a very bad thing. And I would uh, ask you to think about what would happen if there's a successful challenge to these, um, uh, uh, these secret norms or the, this guidance and enforcements based upon them. What would the effect be in terms of really helping the CSRC govern and clean up uh, uh, the, the, inter the, uh, the insider trading and the, the internal uh, capital markets? The last thing that I want to think about and just put before you, and I really have no answers here, is um, what's going on on the CSRC side and what's going on on the side of the people who are enforced against. 
On the CSRC I don't, aside, I don't think you have to be um, uh, too much of a historian to understand that the CSRC feels that it's modern, uh, it's uh, te um, uh, technically uh, proficient. It's also very powerful. It is a government body in China. Those of you who've grown up in China will understand that if I invoke the actions and the assumptions of, say, the magistrate in the Qing dynasty, it's not that far, this idea that um, uh, government departments really have the power to act in a quite arbitrary and non-reviewable uh, uh, fashion. Now, th 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 there's more there than we can talk about in a, in a, in a, in a context like this, and it's probably, um, it's probably too synthesizing a comment, but I would, I would ask you to look at that. I would ask you to understand if there's anything about the way the CSRC has acted in this specific regard, which pertains to the long history of how administrative uh, institutions quote unquote legal institutions uh, act in China. There's two other uh, theories or parts of the discourse which I want to address with respect to the CSRC. One is uh, our friend and uh, colleague Carl Minzner uh, has written recently about China's turn against the law, right? And his examination in this article which is published uh, in the same place that that's gonna be uh, published, the American Journal of Comparative Law, talks about a rhetorical turn against law in China over the uh, past couple of years. Uh, uh, and he, he sees indicia of that in, in many ways. But basically, it's a, an idea that perhaps legal institutions can't do all the work um, uh, that, that we thought they could do. This is in the Chinese context. And perhaps uh, uh, they should be more political rather uh, uh, than legal. I don't really see this problem as part of China's turn against the law, which I don't actually buy into uh, myself. Uh, in particular because this has all been apparent from long before Carl's identified turn against the law. Something which may be of more use is Ben Liebman's idea of uh, the populist influence on the legal system. Ben writes uh, really compellingly about how judicial institutions in China right now are reacting to popular pressure, popular anger, okay? Not necessarily anger against the government, but anger against uh, against certain uh, 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 malevolent characters in society who are doing bad things. Often you'll see um, the political committees that are attached to courts rendering a judgment, uh, enforcing the law in a way that really sticks it to people that everyone seems to agree. If you look at you know, Weibo and uh, all, the, all, all the discourse in China, people, uh, pe people who other people really believe deserve to be thrown in prison or killed or um, uh, uh, you know, uh, other, otherwise uh, penalized. I think that's interesting in this context or the context of the presentation I've made to you. Why is that? Because the people who are guilty of insider trading, not, right, who I say are uh, uh, not actually guilty under the law or they haven't committed an insider trading breach, they've still in many cases committed insider trading. They just haven't done it in a way that fits the uh, partially drafted uh, statute, okay? Uh, the only problem is, of course, that the CSRC is sort of uh, overreaching. And then you think, well, maybe the CSRC is reacting to popular pressure. Maybe they're saying, look, there are people who are manipulating for private gain our securities markets. So who cares? Who cares if what's visited upon those bad person's heads um, uh, is the idea that uh, it, it is something which is, which is illegal. We talk about this as sort of a bad law being used on bad actors. And I, I think there may be something um, uh, to that. For the other side, um, uh, I'm not sure if I'm able to divine as to why there is such tolerance. And Tsui Wei writes about this as well in the tax sphere. The problem is that there's tremendous tolerance for all of these illegal norms being visited upon certain uh, defendants. Now, some of that may have to do with uh, Chinese citizenry's idea as to the power of the government and how government actors are supposed to act and how they're enabled to act, and regardless of whether or not they have law uh, uh, behind them. In the insider trading case, there may be particular circumstances. As I've said, many of these people really are guilty of insider trading, right? They did, uh, they did trade as a tippee. As a tippee, there's no liability under Chinese law, but hell. You know, if you've, if you've taken a tip from your husband or your wife and you've traded on inside information, you might think, well, I'm guilty. You know, it makes sense that someone is going to uh, find me or make me disgorge uh, 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 profits. Also, I would ask you to note that in an insider trading prosecution, as in a tax prosecution or enforcement action, there's not a big group of people, right? We see a lot of resistance right now in China 
uh, through the legal and the political system to kind of these large scale hits on rights, whether it's um, you know, large scale environmental torts, uh, land relocation, even securities trading. Fraud in securities issuance has conjured up a big appetite for group actions. You don't really have that in this case in either tax enforcement or insider trading. And that may take away some of the collective uh, resistance or the idea that, uh, that you could resist. And there are other legal institutional things which I can uh, uh, get into. Um, so uh, I'm going to conclude there because I'm, I'm way past time. And I welcome any questions. But I hope you understand that my, the, 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 the nugget of my presentation is to describe uh, really from an administrative law uh, point of view, serious problems in China's administrative law state, which is kind of ironic because if you think about it, administrative law comes from China, right? What we celebrate in this country and in Europe as administrative law, uh, law uh, acted via uh, agencies pursuant to delegated power, is completely the Qing bureaucracy, right? So think about how ironic that is. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, we have two microphones over here at the front of the room. If you could please just come up and speak into the microphone, that would be great. Hi, I just have a uh, quick question. I'm just wondering uh, why. Can you tell us who you are and where you're from, too? Oh, hi. Um, I'm Alan's student, and I'm from Taiwan, and I'm an um, LM student here. And uh, my question is regarding uh, what do you think, what, is, what makes the difference be, uh, to make uh, the CSRC, they adopt a different theory uh, comparing to the Securities, uh, Securities Act? Because um, um, I'm thinking that um, if um, CSRC, they, they want to adopt the equal access theory, why not they just suggest uh, revising the Securities Act? Is it because uh, it is very difficult to uh, make amendments to laws in China, or just because CSRC doesn't think that uh, it's an, it occurs, there's any ultra-virus issue involved? Yeah, um, I think they're very well aware, by the way, that there is an ultra-virus problem. Uh, I'm going to be in Beijing next week, and I'm going to go speak to the CSRC about it. So that's, that's the last part of your question. Um, note that the, uh, the guidance document, what I'm asserting are the illegal norms, came out in 2007. That was just after the, 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 the wholesale revision of the securities law in 2006, right, or end of 2005, but effective beginning of 2006. So what clearly happened, I believe, and you know, I can confirm this with the CSRC and, and, and various departments, is that they were pushing very hard for the new statute to encompass something like equal access liability. It didn't happen. There's not a lot of change between the 1999 statute and the 2006 statute. So they saw that missed opportunity, in a sense, and then said, oh, we have this little sliver of light to add to the list of persons with knowledge of inside information. Let's use that and drive through it what I'm calling, and what they would call, I'm sure, equal access liability. So I think, in a sense, uh, the last time there was a big amendment, uh, granted, it's very difficult to amend the law in China, they saw that there was, no, uh, there was no amendment forthcoming to widen insider trading liability. So they said, we'll just do it via this guidance document. And that's a bit scandalous for me, and I think anyone who cares about the Chinese legal system, because it's not a public document. It's not an administrative regulation. It clearly uh, has no binding force of law, even before you get to the ultra-virus problem. So that, that's very disappointing, actually, is, is probably a better way to talk about it. But I hope that's clear. Uh, Professor Hurston, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, my name is Zhao Fang. I'm a 2L here. Uh, I have a quick question. What do you think is the economical consequence of the illegal enforcement of the insider trading uh, in China? Um, at this point, I don't know, right? Uh, my worry, as I think I indicated in, my, in the time I had in my remarks, was to say that if there is any uh, resistance to enforcement, which is something that all of us as lawyers, I think, or people concerned about administrative law, we'd celebrate. We'd say, that's fantastic. This is really rule of law in action, right? This is the citizens pushing back against uh, Ill illegal conception and enforcement of law. At the same time, or on the other side, if someone does destroy, overturn all of these enforcement actions that we've seen even before 2007, that only makes insider trading in the Chinese markets, which is very serious right now, 
even more costless or totally costless, right? It says to the world, to all the people who want to uh, inside uh, trade, go forth and prosper, go forth and, and continue uh, insider trading. So I don't know if that's a coherent response, but uh, my worry, as a lawyer, I'm very keen that someone challenge these norms because I think it's a key aspect of what rule of law is. As a lawyer or as a securities law specialist, I'm very worried about these things, these enforcements being overturned because I think that the result is, is a great deal more insider trading. So on a related note, how many, uh, what's, a, what's a percentage do you think are the um, uh, cases that are caught uh, in comparing with all the potential uh, uh, insider trading activities in China? And I think your question is what percentage of cases um, are uh, enforced against on the wider basis yeah. where they couldn't get to them on the, I don't know. Uh, and that's the kind of work that you know, I would have to do with my own eyes to look at each CSRC uh, uh, decision. And I haven't done that. What I have done for this paper is identified quite readily, by the way. It didn't take very long just reading. You know, I, I, I think I read less than 50 decisions. Uh, 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 you, you identify a whole bunch where the basis has to be the illegal guidance. It can't be the statute. And one of the things that's very interesting um, I think I cited to a Supreme People's Court notice which says that you are forbidden now from citing to non-legal or administrative regulations in any case judgment or any administrative judgment. What's fascinating when you look through all these cases is that they just cite to the statute. They say, uh, Mr. Zhao uh, was a person with knowledge of inside information, even though you're the husband and a tippy. Doesn't work, right? But you read it and you go, ah, that's why, because they know they're prohibited from alluding to the guidance. And they know that that would be illegal anyway. So, Thanks. Thank you, Professor Hudson. Uh, my name is Brandy Wu, and I'm a 3L. Um, so I, I, in my question is, in a way, a follow-up to that. I was wondering um, to what extent the, uh, the people's courts have the authority or the power um, to, um, to, to uh, perform judicial review of administrative actions taken in accordance with these informal guidance documents. That, and that's in the paper. And I sort of sum tried to summarize it very quickly. They do not, as you probably know, under the administrative litigation law, have the power to do abstract review, to on their own say, regardless of whether or not that norm is being enforced, it is illegal, it's ultra virus, it's not the thing asked for under the statute. So that's off the table. The more significant question with respect to these norms is whether or not courts can do what they do with respect, or what they can do with respect to lots of administrative regulation or departmental rules, which is say, no, the enforcement, the, this is concrete review, the enforcement of that norm uh, is not justified, is not good, uh, 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 out you go, uh, administrative body. The problem is that the administrative litigation law, the object of affection under the administrative litigation law is public norms, is administrative reg regulation. This guidance is precisely not that, okay? So then you despair for a moment until you see an opinion from the Supreme People's Court which says that what concrete acts are also reviewable in addition to administrative regulations? Administrative guidance of uh, binding force, okay? So there's a little glimmer of daylight in the Supreme People's Court's own, um, uh, own opinion on how we are to construe the administrative litigation law that we may have the basis if we can see that this is an administrative guidance act which is actually being enforced. And I'm here to tell you that it is being enforced. So that's the little glimmer of light. But to date, we haven't seen any of those cases. And I don't know if that's because the defendants have not stood up and said, I resist, or because some have stood up and said, I resist, and a court somewhere has said, uh, we're looking for an administrative regulation. You weren't enforced against pursuant to administrative regulation. You were enforced against pursuant to a duck, let's call it, or something else, right? A not administrative regulation. So it's very complex and very difficult. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nick Shiner, I'm a 1L. Um, my question is about the motivation that you mentioned sort of near the end of the talk for the CSRC to expand the definition of insider trading. If they're motivated by responsiveness to uh, public sentiment, um, that these insider traders are bad actors and maybe they're not being sufficiently punished under the more narrow definition, um, one, where do you think that motivation comes from? Is it, is it coming from 
above the CSRC? And two, if that's their motivation, why do you think that they would keep uh, their broadening of that, uh, of the definition sort of secret, out, you know, and not make it public so that the public would yeah. understand that they're being my, my response to the first part of your question is based on personal data or, you know, relationships with people in the CSRC. These people are almost to, to, a, to a fault, highly professional, very committed, and certainly the people have a lot of influence on how the, how the law is used and enforced, uh, and are really committed to trying to create more level, fairer, more transparent capital markets. So in terms of the motivation as to why someone would cook up this all-embracing liability, uh, it's very understandable to me. They're very keen to do what their job is, right? The next question is harder to answer in any coherent way, and I tried in my remarks. And it's only to say that uh, I believe those same people, as well-intentioned as they are, are situated, embedded in a bureaucratic culture uh, and an idea uh, where there's a great deal of assumption of power, right? an assumption of, in particular, enforcement power. They clearly didn't get what they wanted in the renewed statute in 2006. So they, so they said, uh, not, not to hell with it, no one says to hell with it, but they say, we know what the problem is, we know what the rat poison is we need, we're just gonna smuggle it through this other document and we're gonna go forward until someone calls us on it. And that's the other question is why is no one calling them on it other than a know-nothing foreign scholar in Michigan and Berkeley and Berkeley and Michigan. Thank you. Um, I guess my question is related, sorry. Uh, Who are you? Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm Emily, I'm a student here. Um, the question really is the difference between the tax case and the um, and the insider trading. The difference is it seems like under tax there seems to be a lot of pressure coming in from up top that says you need to stop doing this. What accounts for that difference between the tax enforcement case and the insider trading cases? I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm fascinated uh, by in the tax case. It's the Ministry of Finance and the STA itself which pushed out uh, this. Um, this regulation. Now, I think here's a partial answer. The taxation uh, administration bureaucracy is much more diffuse than the CSRC. So understand there's, of course, the STA in Beijing, but then every locality has its own tax administration. So what we understand was happening before was that those local administrations were burping out tons of material. So it's tax central local tension. I think, I think. Whereas the CSRC, there are local CSRC bodies, but they're terribly disempowered. All the action is at the top or in, in Beijing okay. with respect to the. Okay. Now, your question's a great one because one of the actors, or two actors that I haven't invoked and we should invoke are the Shanghai and the Shenzhen Exchange. They also are in the business of, it's a constant struggle, but drawing some power to themselves. I wonder if we might not get resistance from them, almost as a matter of bureaucratic politics. Because they, they, they have the same interest, contra, insider trading, but they may say, come on, CSRC, you're screwing up on this one. I mean, what's interesting about this, though, in terms of incentives is I don't think it's immediately obvious that all bureaucracies have incentives to expand power. I mean, I think that Absolutely it's intuitive, right. but not necessarily true. And you get cases in China when it comes to things like, um, you know, um, trademark, patent rights, in which the bureaucracies have power but don't want to do anything about it. And I'm wondering what about insider trading is that makes people want to have take on more burden. And I think the explanation that these people are simply more motivated is not really that satisfactory. I mean, that these people are more professional and more dedicated to their jobs as opposed to people in other... Oh, other oh no, but, but it might help explain when you understand the statute is kind of half-baked, right? Just think about tippy liability. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in the CSRC, you look at the statute, there's no liability for tippy trading. No, no way you can read that into the, into the statute, right? right? So you're a responsible person who's concerned about insider trading. You know a lot of the insider trading in the Chinese markets is what we call tippy trading. You go, zut. No, you don't go zut. You go, <laughs> I won't say a bad word in Chinese. You say, darn, right? I can't get that. But I can get it if I blow a hole through, this, uh, through it via this uh, administrative record. That's consistent with a, with a, with a publicly interested pro-enforcement administrative agency, I think. I mean, I think that's contrary to my view of what most bureaucrats do, is that if I don't have the mandate, it means I don't have to do the work, as opposed to, oh, I want to accomplish this goal, but the law doesn't give me as much say as I Yeah, the CSRC is quite different then. Oh, yeah. it, it really is. This is my experience over you know, 20 years. 
there, there's some very significant, very intelligent, very uh, well-intentioned actors. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, that Raymond case, yeah. that's, you know, that's not my question. <laughs> and the tax authority, boy, we don't have a question there, right? Everyone wants to tax more. Okay. Joe sure. will not uh, throw the microphone yeah, at you. Yeah, so. thanks a lot for your talk. Yeah, my name is Lim. I'm a visiting visiting scholar at Stanford Law. Um, my question is regarding the effective solutions to solve the severe insider trading issue in China. Uh, actually, we know that there's no fiduciary concept and no equivalent fiduciary duty under Chinese law, even though we have statutory duties for directors under the Chinese companies. At. Whereas uh, their scope and the extent are not comparable to the fiduciary duty and the common law. So do you think that the adoptions of the fiduciary duty concept or the expanding of the scope of, of the du uh, statutory duties under the Chinese companies or uh, securities regulations that would be an effective yeah. way? Great, great question. And um, uh, in fact, Article 148 of the new company law, I think does, as you say, uh, describe uh, fiduciary duties of directors and officers. Now, if you understand that our, in the United States, certainly our ins early insider trading law was predicated on precisely that fiduciary duty, not nothing to do with the securities trading sphere, but in the corporate law context, that might help someone, it might inf help inform some kind of decision maker uh, as to the presence of a breach of fiduciary duty. I don't think you need that, though, because I think you have under Article um, 74, you have sort of a proxy for fiduciary duty. Who are the persons with knowledge of inside information? They're people that we think of as fiduciaries. So I think, I don't think we have to do the extra work, the extra wondering about somehow injecting fiduciary duty from the corporate sphere into the securities statutory sphere. I think we have it. I think all we have to do is stick with the law and if the CSRC has the power to expand the list of people that we think of as fiduciaries in the marketplace, then do that. But don't you know, ditch the whole fiduciary duty basis via the guidance. Uh, I agree with that because, yeah. I agree with that because in causes causes for adoption of the whole fiduciary concept. But the, but the problem is that the uh, statutory duties under the Chinese law is ambiguous. It only says that um, the the directors own statutory duties and of loyalty and, and diligence. Board members. Yeah, but we don't know when they breach of the duties and what are the exact liability attached to that. Although, so, I mean, uh, this is separate from this presentation. A lot of my own uh, writing has been on the development of fiduciary duties in the purely corporate sphere, uh, in the courts. Uh, and that causes me to read, it seems, thousands of opinions from all over the country. It's something really happening. You know, uh, even though we all understand the Chinese system as a civil law system, which is based in statute, and you know, <coughs> judicial officials can act willy-nilly, whatever, uh, that's not what's happening. There's real development in terms of courts applying corporate fiduciary duties in a very sophisticated manner, actually. Sometimes in a not so, so sophisticated manner. But, so, but it, your question is great, right? Because if you look at the source of the classical theory of insider trading liability in the United States, it's based in 19th century ideas of fiduciary duties you owe to people who hold your stock, right? And that has all been translated into our 10b-5 law and our insider trading law. So, but I think the Chinese statute does that by statute. I just wish the CSRC had done a better job when they were filling out the list of who are the breaching fiduciaries, if that makes any sense. I don't have a, a great background in, in China's history or, or government, so I apologize if this is kind of a very obvious point. Um, <laughs> um, the question, I guess, is in describing these activities as illegal, it kind of presumes a certain hierarchy of laws of statutory authority. Can you yeah. just describe China as a civil law country based on that? But I'm wondering if these kind of internal guidelines that aren't even you know, published regulations are, as you describe them, actually being enforced and then not even resisted. At what point does it start to make sense, like this is kind of the real deal? And, and does this become interesting because it is so uncharacteristic of bureaucratic activity elsewhere? Right, I mean, there was a part of that in my remarks, but I would remind you, and it's in the paper, again, ad nauseum, and people would be on the floor asleep and never to wake up if I talked about it. Um, there are lots of statutory provisions of Chinese law which describe what is an enforceable norm, what is not an enforceable norm, okay? So that, 
I, I want everyone in this room to understand it's not just a presumption that's, say, taken from the Administrative Procedure Act in the United States, right? It's something, these are ideas as to what these norms are that live only in Chinese law, okay? So that's the first thing to say. The second part of your question, of course, is, is, is more difficult, especially when you confront the fact that historically, and certainly since the 1950s, and even into the reform and opening to the outside world period, a great deal of the work of government enforcement, even criminal prosecution, is done pursuant to um, non-legal norms, right? And so your question is, do we just like throw up our hands and go, well, I guess that's China. You know, that's, that's the way it happens there, and China understand what the real meaning of the system is. That might have been an adequate response, I think, circa 1985, okay? What's happened, though, and this is, you know, really pursuant to great work by Chinese academics, people who are living Chinese law, is a lot of resistance to that idea, right? Uh, you know, I don't have to invoke for this group, Sun Zhu Gang, and, you know, on and on. Uh, there's real uh, cognizance now in Chinese society as to what is a, an adequate legal basis for government power and what is not, right? So uh, I wouldn't want us to depart from this room with a very static notion of uh, age-old China that has always enforced the law through a non-legal means. So, so what I'm trying to say is it's very dynamic, and I think there's real, there's real understanding of this problem now in China. Yeah. I have a question also on my desk first. I'm so I'm Joe Casey. And um, so you mentioned that some of the tax enforcement might have political overtones. For example, you mentioned the, the case of um, Ai Weiwei. And are there any cases you found in the illegal enforcement in the security sphere, which also appears that maybe it's very high profile, or it's particularly egregious, or it might have some other underlying um, motivation. Yeah, you've seen some insider trading criminal prosecutions, which happen to be against very powerful figures. Uh, those of you who are from Shanghai and have ever bought um, electronics from Guomei will know that uh, Huang Guangyu was, was, uh, was stuck with an, an insider trading charge. There was a political aspect to that because it was unclear if he was connected to Chen Liangyu and you know if it was more than just a prosecution. Uh, that's the only good example I have so far. We'll see. Maybe Bo Xilai will be revealed to have been. <laughs> I don't know why that name came into my head. We'll see. Thank you for, uh, for having the last chance to ask a question. Uh, so I'm a private practitioner. I used to work for a Chinese agency and also I work for an American company doing this uh, intellectual property enforcement. Mm -hmm. Basically, we, I enforce on, you know, Taobao is a copycat of eBay, so I enforce on trademark, patent, everything on Taobao because there's a close of counterfeit products. When it comes to food or drugs, it becomes more complicated because internet uh, counterfeit pharmaceutical. Uh, so my question is that I know you read a book earlier that it's a very comprehensive um, study of all, overall Chinese and American comparative literature. I wrote this book? Yeah, Ji Tong Yajiang. No, I think that's, uh, that's not me. Okay, well, I think it's <laughs> I'll take credit book. for that book. <laughs> <laughs> it might be, is it Bill Alfred's book? Uh, to, to, I think it's, a, it's an article. Oh, an article? Yeah. Okay. It's back to many years ago. I think, okay. Uh, maybe you're still in Sudan. Oh, okay. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is uh, That was another me years ago. <laughs> the different sector of reform in China's comprehensive administration law, so from finance or IP, which sector, which field would you think is will be most progressive or most chance to uh, become most modernized in terms of Right. Uh, but before I focus on this particular problem, I would have responded immediately. CSRC, China Banking Regulatory Commission, China Insurance Regulatory Commission, and then perhaps STA. Why would I have said that? Because those are all kind of new administrative bodies which didn't exist before. This is not like the Textile Works Bureau, right? This is a new sector with new intelligent people like you trying to determine how to do it under the new system, which is apparently a you know, fa guojia, fa zhengfu, right? So that's where my hopes were. But then again, you know, to be honest, and I will be honest next week with the CSRC, I see this as a very significant problem. And I think as analysts and participants in that society, we should call 
administrative agencies on that, it would only make the, the society better and the rule of law stronger. So, but that, that's, that, my answer would have been that, but now I'm kind of discredited by saying, oh, I bet the CSRC is the one that could really deliver on it. <laughs> You're all going to go, oh, God. Yeah, um, He's schizophrenic. Just, well, almost, almost like this, because uh, recently I just keep an interview by e-discovery in this field of inside training. In this case, they use any kind of uh, technology to listen to your phone, to check your email, to see whether you do something so, do you think like the Weibo in China, the technology is coming? Would that help to facilitate the process of? It will only lead to more problems, and why? Precisely because what I've talked about today, right? The the the, the inclination of the CSRC will be to enforce, regardless of how they get the information, if they tape phone calls, whatever, because they're going to be enforcing against people the law does not allow them to enforce against, like a tippy trader. There is no provision for it, but. When you read the cases on the CSRC website, it's constantly, we heard this in a phone conversation. We have a Weibo statement. You know, dear wife, go down and trade on those shares. So your point is a very good one, but my problem remains. So I think we have to. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Tommy. Let's give the speaker one more.